Back in graduate school, my friend and I decided to run across the Grand Canyon. We we're both pretty experienced ultramarathon runners at the time, so we decided to go and get our plan together, our supplies, and we met bright and early one morning at the south rim of the Grand Canyon and planned to run all the way across to the north rim, distance of about a marathon and 6,000 feet of elevation. And we set off, and I remember it was one of the most beautiful runs of my life, from the lush green of the south rim all the way to the more arid parts and fauna of the north rim. But as we approached the top of the north rim towards the end of the day, we noticed snow on the trail. And there was more and more snow as we got higher in elevation towards the top of the rim where eventually you couldn't even see the trail anymore. And so we very quickly realized that we were not going to be able to make it all the way to the top of the north rim. And the closest shelter was back where we started at the south rim. So our rim to rim run very quickly turned into a rim to rim to rim. So we added on another marathon of distance, another 6,000 feet of elevation gain. And by the time we made it all the way back to the start, under moonlight at this point, my friend turned to me and he said, why did we do this? And the answer that I had, that I came up with, is the same answer that I've had for why I've done any other type of extreme activity in my life or engaged in any type of exploration. And that answer is, why not? I think that I have been very privileged in, in my career to see and do a lot of different things on this planet from spending time underwater on a nuclear submarine in the Navy to going to the North Pole to Antarctica. And all of those experiences have taught me that there's really two types of exploration that we do when we explore. One is the exploration of our outer space. It's the, the type of exploration we're probably all more familiar with on a day-to-day -day basis. And the other is exploration of our inner space. And by inner space, I mean the realm of our thoughts, of our emotions. It's where what makes you, you lives. And it's really the filter through which we see and interpret the, the physical world around us. And to be an effective explorer of our outer space, we need to be effective explorers of our inner space and vice versa. They build on each other. So life itself is a story of exploration from the very first monocelled and multicellular organisms like cyanobacteria up there that evolved from the primordial soup of the planet to the very first fish that spread throughout the oceans, the animals that spread on land and birds in the sky. All of these evolutions in life have been stories of exploration driven really by a need for additional resources. We as humans are a little bit different in this respect. We go and climb the highest mountains and dive to the deepest depths in the ocean, not for additional resources, but for an innate sense of curiosity that is really baked into our DNA. And as we stand at this precipice of the next stage in exploration in outer space, it's very important to understand this relationship between our inner space and our outer space and how it can make us better explorers. So I think we could probably all imagine different times in our lives where our inner space has affected our outer space and vice versa. Some examples from my personal life are on the submarine, on the Sea Wolf that I served on. On my first deployment, we were hundreds of feet underwater, separated from the surface of the ocean by several feet thick layer of ice in the Arctic. And at this point, we're several weeks into, into the deployment. And we had a critical piece of life support equipment that failed on board. And I was in charge of leading the team that was responsible for repairing this equipment. And this was the first time that I had been in a real high consequence situation in an operational environment like this, underwater on a nuclear submarine. And I felt these, these emotions of kind of this animalistic fear a little bit of panic and just this general sense of unsureness in myself. And I allowed these emotions to, to sway my actions in, in my outer space. And I took actions that were a little too hurried. And it actually resulted in not repairing the equipment, but damaging it further. And we were luckily able to rely on some backup equipment on board to get through the rest of the deployment, but it was by far not a, a nominal state to, to operate in. 
Uh, so I did a lot of internal reflection on that event afterwards and really dug into the, the emotional state that brought me to those actions. And on a subsequent deployment, we were in a situation that wasn't a result of a broken piece of equipment, but it was an emergency situation. And I felt those same kind of senses, those animalistic emotions rising up in me. But this time, I recognized them. I was able to label them from that reflection that I had done before and still take action in a calm and, and rational manner because of that. And we were able to make it through that situation with, without issue. Another example of how our inner space can affect our, our outer space or vice versa is in the overview effect. And for those of you who are not familiar with, with the overview effect, it's, it's really this profound shift in the way that people who have been to space, astronauts, report seeing the world afterwards as a result of seeing the Earth separated from the void of space by just that thin blue limb of the atmosphere and the fact that there's no borders visible in any of the countries on the planet below and that associated sense of fragility, really, that arises for our place on the planet and for the planet itself and the sense of interconnectedness that comes along with that that mental shift shapes the way that they see the planet and our place in it afterwards. So it's a very clear way how exploration of our outer space can affect our inner space, the lens with which we see the world, and how that affects our exploration of our outer world afterwards. So extreme events like this, like being underwater on a submarine or flying in space, are great ways to, to become better explorers of either our physical world or our inner space as well but they don't all have to look like that. In fact, one of the most, what I would consider extreme things that I've done is recently a silent meditation program, which was just nine days of no communication, no writing, no electronics, no speaking with anyone, and just a concerted focus on turning the sense of exploration inward and really just focusing on getting to know myself better and my emotional state and what, what the shape of all that looks like. And it was one of the, the most useful and productive things I've done in my life, but also one of the most challenging things, ironically, uh, because it's, it's not always easy or pleasant to be inside of our own, our own minds and to, to turn that attention inwards. Uh, but it was one of the most productive things. And we can, we can think of other potentially extreme situations that you know, don't take the shape of, of running across uh, Grand Canyon or, or being underwater in a nuclear submarine. It's, it's all subjective in that, in that respect. And these, these types of experiences, uh, these extreme experiences to, to grow as an explorer of our outer space or inner space, they, they don't need to be extreme at all. We can still find that sense of exploration and, and, and improve as explorers by bringing a new perspective to things in our daily lives, by being truly present in a conversation with a friend and taking these, these novel perspectives because that is really what exploration is, is all about. And I think NASA really recognizes this, uh, this fact because just down the road here at Johnson Space Center is NASA's Human Exploration Research Analog, which is a two-story analog space habitat that is designed to host a crew of four analog astronauts for missions up to 45 days that is focused on studying the effects of isolation and confinement on teams in the analog of a deep space environment. And HERA isn't focused on hardware or software analysis for these types of environments. It's focused on the human elements of this entire system, which I think is really special. And they do cognitive studies, behavioral dynamic studies, ultimately to inform crew selection and how we can implement countermeasures for the, the challenges that astronauts will face on future deep space exploration missions. And I had the privilege of uh, participating in one of these missions with my crew up there with Christian, Julie, and Anna. And we learned a lot about ourselves and how we work together as a crew. And I think NASA got a lot of very valuable information from it. And we're also all still friends, which is uh, important. But I think one of, one of the, the most interesting parts of this, or one of the most critical parts, is that right now we're at a time in human history 
where less than 700 people have ever been to space, have ever flown above the Kármán line, above 100 kilometers. And in order to take this next step where we're going to see thousands, if not tens or hundreds of thousands or even millions of people, of pioneers, going into space for the first time, which will likely include at least several people in this room, we need to work at an international scale. Working at an international scale takes empathy. It takes perspective taking. And in order to build empathy and truly understand other people's perspectives, we need to have good self-knowledge and be good explorers of our inner space. So that's an absolutely critical first step to taking on this, this big challenge that we are all a part of right now as humans. So as we go forward today, I challenge all of us here to think about how we can be better explorers in our day-to-day -day lives right here, right now. It doesn't take going to space to be an explorer. We can do it just here in this room. And it definitely doesn't take running back and forth across the Grand Canyon or being underwater on a submarine, take it from me. Um, because I think Carl Sagan really summed up this entire concept the best when he said that we are the universe exploring itself. And why do we explore? Why not? Thank you.